so yeah. <laughs> On the first night that we got there, we all sat in a circle and said what our expectations and hopes were for the trip. For me, it was one, to exit my comfort zone and to try new things, and two, to experience something awe-inspiring, the kind of thing that you would read about in a book, a God moment. Exiting my comfort zone was an easy one for me. Trying new things has never been my strongest suit. So the moment I got out of the van, I had already taken three giant leaps outside of my comfort zone. I held my breath and told myself to see how the first night goes before I trust this place 100%. Well, I survived the first night and woke up in one piece. The first day, we experienced a new style of a Sunday morning. We all got ready and dressed for church, and we sat around with Pastor Thomas and his kids and another man. I had heard that the children had their children's church in the neighborhood rec center. I guess I just kind of assumed that the children's church took place before church, and they all just came over together for the service. And when Pastor Thomas got up and said, okay, I have to go pick up the kids, I'll be back in a few, I assumed that my assumption was true. He came back with one kid and introduced us all to a boy named Victor. Not too long after, a couple of more boys showed up. And as we were eating breakfast, Victor asked Nathan and, I, Nathan and I if we would go play basketball with them later. And me thinking that he meant after church, and since we didn't have any plans for the rest of the day, I gladly agreed to go play with them. It turns out that children's church was not before church, it was during church. And children's church consisted of playing basketball. Nathan and I had already agreed to go play with them, so we sang two songs during the service, and then the kids were dismissed. Caleb, Jake Lindstrom, Nathan, Darren, and I all went to play basketball with the kids, while the rest stayed for the church service. When we got there, we played around with a bunch of balls, and everyone was off in a couple of groups, just kind of doing their own thing. Then, Pastor Thomas came in and told everyone to go to the next room, where they had their actual Sunday school lesson. After the lesson, we played a full-out five-on-five basketball game, which I, still dressed in my church clothes, played in a dress. <laughs> I'd also like to add that I was first pick out of the team captains. <laughs> the kids there just had a blast, and when we pulled up back to the church, Pastor Thomas said, all right, if I'm taking you home, stay in the van. And that struck me kind of hard. These kids, Stay, Victor stayed in the van, while Isaiah and Eli said that they would just walk home. Most of the kids that we played basketball with didn't come to church with their families. They came under their own free will. The fact that these kids came to church because they wanted to changed my whole perspective. I look back to this congregation here at home, and I tried to pick out which kids would come even if their parents didn't. My list here was a little bit shorter than theirs was there. So I began to think of why these kids came to church on their own each Sunday morning. I could only think of two reasons. That they either really believed in God and knew that this was the direction they wanted their lives to go, or that they saw it as a chance to just get out of their house for a couple of hours. And after hearing the insight of some of the other kids we met throughout the rest of the week, option number two seemed more and more likely. Maybe they came here week after week just to feel like someone cared for them and to see a smile. And whether or not option number two was the real reason they all came, I feel like we really made an impact on how the rest of their day was going to go. They all kept asking if we would be there next Sunday to play for some more. And as they started leaving, I made sure to tell them, thank you for letting us play with them, or good job today. Because maybe that was going to be the only kind words that they were going to hear for the rest of the day. The next day was our first day of mission. We split up into two groups. One group stayed at the church that we were staying at, and the other went to another church across the neighborhood. My group stayed here at Westside. Our first job was to go door to door, handing out flyers, advertising the school that Westside doubled as. This just became three more giant leaps outside of my comfort zone. We are in downtown Denver, in the second poorest neighborhood. And if that doesn't scare you, it should, <laughs> or at least it scared me, and Matt, and Brennan, and Stephanie, and Tara. <laughs> 
Some of these houses and people were a little bit intimidating. The first couple of blocks, I thought, I think we were all pretty much on edge the whole time. And Matt was the only person who got yelled at to back off. We made our way around town and finally finished up. Later that same day, I volunteered to go out and hand out more flyers with Stephanie, Rebecca, and Jenna. This time around, I put my guard down a little bit because nothing went wrong the first time, so it was a little easier to walk up to people's door and very quickly half walk, half run away. <laughs> so as Stephanie and I were walking down one of the streets, we came across a man out watering his flowers in his lawn. He had seen other groups handing out flyers a couple of weeks before, so he knew what we were doing. He started up a conversation with us, and it took an interesting direction. He started talking about how wonderful the Lord is, and that he is just a blessed man. He said that he is blessed to be able to go fishing every morning. And I was like, alright, he likes to go fishing. Then he said that he goes fishing for souls. He told us that he thinks of himself as an apostle. Apostle Frank is what he called himself. He went on to say that apostles were just common people, not too high up on the social ladder, kind of like himself. Also, that the apostles went farther out into the ocean to fish, because that's where Jesus told them to go. Nobody else fished out there because it was dangerous, and not too many fish lived out there. But they went fishing out there anyway. And that Peter used his old nets, because he didn't want to waste his good nets in the dangerous parts of the water. Apostle Frank said that he likes to go fishing every morning by walking around his neighborhood to try to catch the fish that slipped through the worn out nets and never got caught. That he was going to save his neighborhood one fish at a time. He then told us a story about himself. He told us that one night he was sitting in a bar, smoking a cigarette and drinking a beer. So he played in the band that played at the bar. So he's sitting in a bar smoking a cigarette and drinking a beer, when a pastor comes up to him and lays out the entire path of the Bible right in front of him. He said that if that pastor was sent that very night to that very bar, then it had to be a message from God, because how often do pastors go up to strange people in a bar and start preaching? So Apostle Frank said that he used to be one of those fish that slipped through the net, and God had sent a fisherman to catch him that night in that bar. So he made it his mission to do the very same to the people of his neighborhood. Little did he know that he had also made an impact on me. Lately, I suppose, you could say that I've been a fish, stuck in between falling out of the net and being completely in the net. It's been easy for me to stay in the net these past 18 years because I've had my family and the people of this congregation to hold me close and to keep me in the net. But having to leave in the fall, I've been contemplating how I'm going to stay in the net. I've had sleepless nights thinking about if I was going to go to church every weekend at K-State, or if I wanted to join campus ministry, or if I just wanted to spend my Sunday morning sleeping in. I've been fighting over all these options for weeks now, but Apostle Frank, whether he knew it or not, answered all of my questions for me. This week, answered all of my questions for me. Apostle Frank gave me that last nudge I needed to hop back into the safety of the net. I think God told me to volunteer to go help out help pass out flyers again for the second time, even though I was scared the first time, and there's plenty of other youth that hadn't even gone out there yet that I could have gladly passed the job along to. God told me to go back out there because Apostle Frank needed a fish to save that day, and that fish was me. The next day, on our way to another church for the extreme neighborhood makeover we were going to be doing, I told my mom to drive down his street to see if he was out watering his plants again. And sure enough, there he was, as jolly as could be with his old work, short, old work shirt with the name Frank embroidered into the chest and his old fishing hat on. This trip has changed my perspective in many ways, as I'm sure any of the youth could tell you. But none of the other youth had the opportunity to meet Apostle Frank, and only some of us went to go play basketball during the church service. So I can't help but think that God took me on this trip for a reason, that he led me to Apostle Frank's front yard on purpose. So on this trip, I met both of my expectations. I stepped out of my comfort zone the minute we got there, and I had my awe-inspiring God moment standing next to Stephanie and Apostle Frank's front yard.
this trip, um, most of all of you have a general idea about this town and uh, about the neighborhood that we live in. And most of you will agree with me saying that this is a fantastic community because almost all of us know almost all of our neighbors. Uh, regardless of how far away it is, unless you're going five miles west, no matter what, who asks you to do something for them. <laughs> Almost all of you will say yes, without a doubt. And that's something that's very fantastic, but it's very easy to do because we have such a small community. It took going to somewhere that was much larger, where you didn't have the opportunity of just sticking to your own neighborhood, where it really made an impact on most of our lives to realize that our neighbors extend much farther than just this town of Silver Lake. So, this is what we were talking about most of the weekend, simply because we realized that life is much larger than we think it is in this small town. And this is what we spent most of our devotion talking about the, uh, this Sunday morning that we did our devotion with Tara and Jenna. In fact, when I got on Google last night and looked up what the definition of, uh, of neighbor is, uh, the number one hit surprisingly actually says neighbor is a fellow human being. Which is fairly great because a lot of other definitions talk about the vicinity as to how far away you live from one another. However, we do realize that Obviously, we're all put on this earth for a reason, and that by choosing only a certain few, we aren't dealing with all of our neighbors in mind. In fact, it even uses at dictionary.com the example as to be generous towards one's unfortunate neighbors. In Silver Lake, we oftentimes don't see a lot of poverty throughout our small little town. In fact, it's hidden fairly well. However, if you spread out into different parts of the country, especially in Denver, Colorado, we are staying in the second poorest neighborhood, as Logan talked about which is very easy to see poverty all over the place. This meant that as we were going out, we kept in mind this idea of what a neighbor is by helping out one of our unfortunate others because they're all around. And if we were to try and stick to our select few that looked maybe happy enough that we would like to go talk to, then we wouldn't be reaching that many. In fact, um, this is uh, um, all the use all the youth actually took a turn with a devotion night, um, and this is why we based ours around being a neighbor, because we took our, the first night. In fact, this is before we went out into the community, so this is our kind of motivation for the next day to not try and exclude any of our neighbors, but to try and be welcoming to all, which turned out to be great because we met a lot of uh, very interesting people. However, we base this devotion off of scripture, and Luke tw uh, 10, 21 starts out a story between, uh, with a conversation between a lawyer and Jesus. This lawyer is asking G Jesus, um, how may I actually reach eternal life? And Jesus says, well, what do you think it says in the Bible? And this lawyer says, well, maybe if I were to love the Lord your God with all of my might, with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, and all of your mind, and to love thy neighbor. Then Jesus responds with, yes, do this, and you will have life. This is a pretty strong message. One, because the lawyer actually got something right without finding a loophole. <laughs> the second thing is he was right in the fact that you can have eternal life by doing two very simple tasks. The first one is to love the Lord your God. I would hope that everybody in this room can say that they do that because of all the blessings you get every day. And the second one is just as easy as well. It is to love your neighbor as thyself. Obviously, in this town of Silver Lake, we do that almost every day, as I was already talking about. However, this taught us to go out into the rest of the world and be uh, neighbors to whoever we find because, um, uh, because they are the unfortunate others that we are talking about. This taught us that we are to love everyone we meet instead of just the select few that we found. And so, Jesus taught him that if he will just use the love and strength that he has for God on his neighbor, he will live. We use this as we are going to places like Crossroads, which is filled with eager children ready to play and talk all the time. We are definitely using all of our physical strength trying to physically keep up with all these children. We are using all of our mental strength just as much trying to keep up with all the different conversations that each child is willing to have with you. However, one girl certainly took the, uh, took the crown when she had the best prayer of her all week. She says in her prayer, this will be the best day of my life. In fact, this is the best day ever. This stuck to all of us for a pretty good reason, and the reason is because um, 
we the idea that just by being in this girl's life, uh, having us 18 people there, she was having the greatest day ever just because we were willing to be neighbors to her. We learned fast that a lot of these kids at Crossroads don't have the family that we are used to, don't have the ability to go home to a mother and a father and siblings. So we realized that just by being there, just by having fun with these children, regardless of who we were, as long as we had a smile on our face, willing to talk to them, we were doing what they don't get to do every single day. Therefore, we were being a great neighbor. That impacted our lives as well. However, we also did a lot more than just being at Crossroads. As we were cleaning up the streets of Denver, we literally went through alleyways, painted garages and fences so that it would take the graffiti off. We picked up broken glass, we swept up trash, we shoveled up a bunch of uh, different things that I'd rather not talk about. <laughs> However, we did this and only we saw maybe two people that even came out and said thank you. Another devotion that we had was talking about would you be willing to do something for another if you didn't get the credit you felt you deserved. A lot of us said yes because we felt we were called by Jesus to do so. That was the reason that we were willing to go out to these alleyways and do all this work was because we thought we had a purpose for being there. And that wasn't to get all the credit from each uh, neighbor we saw. It was simply to do so because we knew that if we were to help at least one person, maybe the person who now feels safer because they don't see the gang's graffiti, or even the parent who doesn't have to clean up the glass out of their children's foot by walking through the alleyways. That is worth it for us because we realized that as Jesus said, if you were to help the least of people, you are helping me. Therefore, we went through and we did all of this uh, as we attempted to meet or, or we attempted to help our neighbors without needing to have the <coughs> glory of, for ourselves. Now, the final thing that we did that was really surprising was, and it changed our perspective greatly, came on Thursday. We were back at Crossroads, but today was a little different because they had a clothes and food drive. This food drive was really what I helped with the most, and I believe there's a couple others who helped me unpack a lot of the vans. When the first van pulled up, it was full of food, mostly bread items, in fact. There was cupcakes, there was loaves of bread, there was donuts, and the thing that was very sad was when the van first opened, I looked at a lot of the products, and they looked a little moldy, they looked smashed, they looked like they had just been thrown in the van, and to most of us, by the way, we would say no thanks. But we realized after we were carrying the bread in for quite a while, and setting it up, and ready, waiting, watching the people waiting to get this food, that we get the luxury in a place like this to decide what food we like to eat. But it was because of the help we had and because of our other neighbors who were willing to help that these people got to eat this sort of bread, that they got to eat, even eat at all. And without our help, they wouldn't have gotten that opportunity to. And so that really changed us from perspective to see that while we have it so great, that without other help from neighbors, that there are people in this world who wouldn't get some at all. So I was happy to be able to help for that, even though I didn't feel like uh, it was the quality that you know some people should be getting. It was very well worth it. Also, there was a second thing that really changed our perspective. It was probably the most important lesson on the trip, in fact, because while we were there to help our neighbors out with repaying, uh, without any sort of repayment, as I was talking about with cleaning the streets, we were actually learning from each person we interacted with. In fact, it was though it was through the kids at Crossroads where we were uh, that were truly preaching to us. In fact, this was to show us that no matter who it is, or what they look like, or what and what neighborhood they're in, they're there so we can help them, but more importantly, so they can teach us. Therefore, we learned that even though the child is just there to have fun, and that he doesn't get that opportunity much, that if we were to help our neighbors, we can also get that in return. Um, and the best part is that even though we aren't in Denver, Colorado anymore, we don't have to stop helping our neighbors. In fact, we can go five miles west if necessary to help the neighbors that we have there as well. It's great that we did this mission trip because all of us youth now have the tools in hand to help the neighbors of this world that we have. However, it doesn't take moving. Or it doesn't take going to a different state to do so. By hearing this message, hopefully you all uh, have a little bit more knowledge about how your neighbors are important as well, and that you have the opportunity to go out and help the rest of your neighbors in the world, as many of you do so. But the best part is, since we've done it, now you know as well, and so the whole Silver Lake United Methodist congregation has the power to change another's life, 
one person at a time. For if you do something for the least, you're doing something for God as well. We, from the beginning of this trip, um, some of you know that we were a little worried financially about getting there. Things were a little tough and tight, and um, I had a lot of sleepless nights, and I was worried. I was worried about the kids uh, and their safety. We got to Denver that first night, and we're driving, <laughs> we're driving down the street, and there's this lady that's kind of hugging the pole. <clears throat> and they asked if this was the neighborhood we were staying in, and I said yes. And uh, when we got to the church, when he said it was the second most poorest neighborhood um, in the city, many of the kids looked at me saying, I thought we were staying in a church with like, you know, a nice youth center and nice walls and just a huge big church and that wasn't the case at all. But these kids made us proud. Uh, the first night that we were there, we got our list and uh, we got the list of stuff that we're supposed to do. And um, Westside Academy was the church, it was the school at the church that we stayed at, Westside Fellowship, is that right? Did I have that right? Westside Fellowship was the name of the church, it was a non-denominational church, so our youth got to experience worship completely different. And um, that first night he gave us our job, or that first day he gave us our jobs, it was supposed to last us at least three days. I want you guys to know that our youth took that list we separated, we conquered, and we got everything done on that list by 3 o'clock that day. 3 o'clock. We got three days worth of work, at least what they thought we would do in three days. The first day from 9 o'clock in the morning to 3 o'clock. I want you to know that Pastor Mark, who was the uh, senior pastor there, and Pastor Thomas, who was the one that was with us most of the time there, said that he has had groups all summer long come in. And, you know, I told them, make sure you give us a list because I promise we're going to conquer it. We've been doing that all summer. Every week we've been going to Mission Mania. Every single place we've went, we've been told that our youth get it done with positive attitudes, without complaining, and they just do it. And before we left, and in fact, I got a um, text message and an email from them this morning. first one said, please come back. <laughs> please, please come back. But he said, I want you to know that your youth did an amazing job. And that it was the first group this summer that did not have any negative comments to say out loud. We had some looks we gave, we had silent looks we gave each other <laughs> to kind of filter. Um, if we didn't, weren't sure of something. But it was the first time that he'd had a group that worked really, really hard, was above expectations, and did so with a happy, healthy heart. And I want to say thank you to this congregation. Because I know it's because of this congregation, the love, the care, the dedication, and the sacrifice that all of you in the pews do. You may not think you make a difference, but just by being positive role models for these kids, by coming into church every single Sunday, our youth can look in the church and they can tell you who's here every week or who's not. And it's because of you that our kids know that they have a strong work ethic and that God will always be on their side. And Silver Lake United Methodist will always be on their side. During our last night, what I'm most proud of with these kids is that every night we did devotions. And we split up the group. And I had not a single person complain. Because during devotion time, um, they had to say a prayer. And they had to incorporate some Bible verse. And every single night, every single one of our youth participated in that in some way. They all spoke up and they said something. And I'm telling you, those are God moments that I couldn't script, that God himself had a huge hand in. And so I really appreciate that. And then on the last night, we gathered together, and again, we reminded each other that just as both of these two, and what you'll hear more at lunchtime, we are a family here at Silver Lake. Don't laugh. Just to scare me. 
or the time we went and we cleaned up graffiti and those first few moments you're kind of scared, afraid what happens if a gangster person goes around the corner and we're cleaning up the graffiti that they've marked. Those were some scary moments. But we practice what we preach here every Sunday. We believe that we are called to love our neighbor. And we were reminded that even in the chaos that's going around our world right now with what people think about immigration and all those things, that God has called each of us. God has made all of us. It doesn't matter who we are, where we're from, what language we speak. God made each of us. And we are to come together and be neighbors to Rossville too. <laughs> And I am just so proud of those moments. And um, one of the things that really tugged at my heart was one of the evenings um, we were. Can I show this? Yeah. Um, one of the evenings that we were gathered together, and I was really uh, trying to get the message across of being neighborly and helping people and just loving people, loving people that aren't always easy to love. And um, the next morning, I got up at 6.15, 6.30, thinking I'm the first one in the shower. And I go out into the kitchen, and there's Nathan. He has wet hair, and he's writing. And he's just like, he looks like he'd had coffee. He was just, just going 90 miles a minute. And I go in there, and I'm like, well, Nathan, did you sleep? Because the kids did a really good job of curfew. The last night, I don't give them a curfew. I just sleep through that. <laughs> Um, but that night, we had a curfew, 11.30 each night, and Nathan's in the writing, and he's like, I've been up for hours. Well, first my heart sank, like, ah, oh, they did so good, now we're kind of slipping. And he's like, you know what, Stephanie? He's like, I just, I couldn't sleep. I started, like, laying down, and I'm sleeping, and I was just, he's like, I just got to thinking about what you were saying, and I was thinking about the kids that we saw, and he goes, I couldn't sleep. So I got up, and I started writing. And, he's like, and I go over there, and he's written two pages. Um, I will share with you that after worship today, when you're at lunch, I had each of the youth and adults uh, put a little something, reflections of their trip, something that they're always going to remember. Please, 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 in the next few weeks, please take time to read this. There are some amazing things in this notebook that they said. But as I'm sitting there talking to him, he's like, yeah, I just can't sleep. And he goes, you know what, Stephanie? He's like, I want to be an engineer when I grow up. But this trip has me thinking, I think I might want to be a missionary. I might just want to be the next Mike Rick. <laughs> and I said, okay. And he's like, yeah. He's like, maybe I'll build houses. I don't know. He's like, but, you know, God is, God is at, work here, at work here. And that is the theme for our entire week. Um, if you'll, Jake, go to the picture of Emiliano. I know I need to wrap up. <clears throat> on the last day at Crossroads, when we had the water war, and I wasn't expecting to get wet, this little boy is named Emiliano. He's probably six, maybe. Emiliano um, was this cute little kid, and he was one of the first ones that nailed me with water. <laughs> Cold water, Colorado water. And we were getting ready to eat lunch. The water stuff is over, and all the kids had changed clothes. Well, I didn't take clothes. And I'm sitting there, and I'm freezing. I mean, that water is very cold. And I'm so cold. And Emiliano comes up with that red sweatshirt that I've got on. And he says, Miss Stephanie, Miss Stephanie, please, put this on. He's like, you're cold. And I said, it's okay, Emiliano. I'm okay. I'm going to be fine. So he kind of goes off, and I watch him, and he's still watching me. And the concern in his eyes, he just had these huge eyes. And so he comes back over, Miss Stephanie, Miss Stephanie, please, will you please put this on? He's like, you're cold, and I don't like to see people cold. Will you please put this shirt on? And when I looked at his eyes, I got a lump in my throat, and I said, yes, Emiliano, I'll put it on. So I put this sweatshirt on, and he's like, thank you, I'm so glad you're warm again. And he gave me a big old hug. Congregation, that is a reminder. That sometimes we think that we're going places and that we're the ones that are helping other people. But it's a reminder that other people bless our lives and have a part of this journey as well. It's a reminder that each of us are called. And sometimes we're the receiving and sometimes we're the giving. But it goes hand in hand. And this week has been another testament to that. Um, I feel like I've had the opportunity to get to know the adults a lot better. I know Darren's got to know us really well, because we kind of threw Darren into this first year. Um, but these youth grow my faith, 
help me when things are feeling tight and when I'm exhausted and tired, I can go spend a week with these kids. And even though I'm exhausted and tired, God has filled my cup. And I just want to say thank you to every single one of you who helped make it happen. Thank you for those that gave extra funds. Um, Sue shared with me that um, they had a little bit of a surprise. They thought that the extra giving would actually make offering go down, and it didn't. Giving was just as high. And God is truly at work here, and I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. I have the best job in the world, and there's no place I'd rather be than here with all of you serving Christ. Amen. Amen.